Well, welcome back to my channel. <laughs> Sounds so cool saying that. But tonight, yes, because it's, well, technically it's morning. It's 12.27 a.m. and I'm not recording this. Um, you look at section B, the syllabus, in this first of two videos. Um, section B of the CSEC physics syllabus is thermal physics. All right, now, if memory serves, it begins with a definition of um, temperature, P-R-A-T-R-E. -E. Temperature is defined one of two ways. Well, you should know both, by the way. The first is it is a measure of the kinetic energy of the molecules in a body, B-O-D-Y. The second definition for temperature is it indicates the direction in which heat flows. This is how we define temperature. Now we define temperature this way because we do not use hot or cold, right? We, we, we don't say hot and we surely do not say cold. The reason we say neither of these two terms is simple. Hot and cold are subjective. What is hot for you might not be hot for me. What's cold for you might not be cold for me. So for this reason, we avoid hot and cold. Now. Moving on, we move to um, measuring temperature. Move to measuring temperature. Actually, no. We have to look at the um, the nature of heat. N a t u r e of heat. So the nature of heat. There are, there are two words that um, sound similar because they're related to each other. Caloric and, and frigoric. Um, the idea was put forward many, many, many years ago that heat was an invisible, colorless, odorless substance. And it flowed from objects when the objects were punctured or basically when you put holes in them. That was the general theory. Um, and this was called the caloric theory. Now, some people call it the caloric theory. I, tomato, tomato, same thing. Um, if you look at the word caloric, you could clearly see it's related to calorie. Um, yeah, they're, they're relatives. Now, the caloric or the caloric theory simply said um, heat. But of course, I'm, I'm paraphrasing. I am not uh, quoting the, the law. Heat is an invisible um, uh, color, C O L O U R L E S S, colorless and odorless, O O D O U R. Why am I scratching out when I could erase? O D O R L E S S, substance. which flows or moves between objects will be J E C T S. Good. This is the caloric theory. Now, um, this theory is clearly flawed. It doesn't take a scientist to see this. Now, two experiments come to mind. There was uh, the cannon boring Canon boring, B O R I N G. Now, this is not saying that cannons are boring. This is just describing how cannons were made. Cannons were made by a process where you basically, you had that's not what I wanted to. You had a cylinder, and a hole was drilled through the cylinder, and 
that portion that was cut out that portion made the made the um cylinder into a a cannon now during this process the man in charge count rumford c-o-u-n-t r-u-m-f-o-r-d he noticed that the apparatus got really really hot only when they were working right e of o b s e r v e d the apparatus a p p a r a t u s became very hot only while drilling d r i l l i n g was taking place right this is what he noticed so he decided to submerge the entire apparatus in water he was able to do more work but the same end was achieved the water got hot as a result of work being done now the caloric theory basically says you put a hole in something and the heat is supposed to flow out this creates a few questions for example if you get two sticks right and you rub them together like a caveman you would generate heat you rub them together hard enough and fast enough you could get fire now if you take those same two sticks rub them together until like you get smoke today and you put them down and you pick them up next week and you start rubbing them together again you get heat your hands you rub your hands together you get heat whether night noon midday morning you get heat the caloric theory should have one simple fact if you have an object right this object has volume if caloric is a fluid then the volume of the object should limit the amount of caloric you have but no such limit was ever found in the cannon boring process as long as work was being done there was heat then came a name that you probably should remember from mechanics a guy by the name of james jewel now jewel's work was simple but significant j-o-u-l-e jewel's experiment e-x-p-e-r-i-m-e-n-t now what jewel did was he conducted a simple experiment and he basically took a um if memory serves it was something like a, a barrel or what we call a drum he filled it with water and he put some paddles in it and what he determined was the amount of work done turning the paddles was directly proportional to the increase in temperature again this is what he found he found that heat was produced when work was done so Jules you, you don't need to know the diagram you just need to know that he proved he proved there was a relationship between work done and he generated or produced and this led to the conclusion of our little topic the conclusion was heat is produced when work is done and this is what we commonly call the kinetic theory K I N E T I C the kinetic theory of good old heat and that's it this is the nature of heat well, the history of the nature of heat I never came across who made or who first put the caloric theory to us or to, to mankind or who 
that's really a bad sentence who who postulated a kinetic theory or who theorized i said kinetic when i meant caloric but whoever made it i've never found a name um but you should remember rumford and cannon boring and you should remember jewel now we move on to measuring temperature all right measuring temperature M E A S U R I N G, measuring temperature, T E M P. All right, quickly. First of all, this is done indirectly. Secondly, um, it is done using, well, this is an offshoot of being indirect. I stand corrected. It's done indirectly by observing O-B-S-E-R why did I put my I there? O-B-S-E-R V-I-N-G the changes in physical quantities due to the or a ah, change in temperature Right now, these physical properties have a fancy name. They are called thermometric properties. And some examples are um, length, volume, uh, current, resistance. Now, interestingly enough, these two are very common by product of changing temperatures because heating causes expansion. You might have seen GPL, GT&T, or even the appearance when they string lines in the yard to hang clothes you have two posts right forgive the fancy posts and you have your wire between them now your wire is initially here but over time and not because the posts are leaning no 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 we're not talking about that over time the wire gets lower and lower that is because constantly being in the sun all day causes the cable to be heated often and plenty and therefore it expands and the only way it can expand it doesn't get thicker it just gets longer all right with that being done the next thing we move on to is types of thermometers thermometers so Thermometers. First, we have is our alcohol A L co all in in glass. All right now, if you're asked to sketch this thermometer, your thermometer should look like a thermometer, right? I mean, my thermometers never look like thermometers. I am not an artist. I really am terrible at trying. But anyways, look. I need one. This is, those of you who know me, none of my drawing skills are ridiculously poor. But I, that, that's my thermometer. I've done that, fed up. Good. So. This is your thermometer. Let me put my fancy liquid in my thermometer. I will use red. And I will now label. So. This is a knob. This is a vacuum. This is a scale. This is your 
reservoir. All right, and that's it. Now, every one of you by now should have at least used one of these thermometers. Heat is applied to the reservoir, and as the um, liquid gets heated, it expands and rises up the um, evacuated tube. That's how it works. A couple things. Yeah, that's it. That's it for this one. Um, then there is your thermocouple. Thermocouple, C O U P L E. This is your um, this is your hot junction. This is your cold junction. We should use capital C for cold, cold junction, J U N C T I O N. This is a very, it's a galvanometer, very sensitive. Voltmeter. Uh, now. How the thermocouple works is pretty straightforward. You have two metals, two different metals, by the way, and they are joined together at the hot junction but connected to a third metal at the cold junction. Now, this is the cold junction, by the way, where these two metals meet. That's your cold junction. This is your hot junction. What happens is when you place the hot junction on the object whose temperature you want to know. The electrons move this way towards the cold junction in that metal and they move this way towards the cold junction on that metal. Now a potential difference of voltage a potential difference of voltage is created here. Right? You have some voltage created across these two ends of the cold junction and the potential difference is measured by a very sensitive voltmeter and can be interpreted as a temperature and that's your thermocouple now the final one is the constant volume gas thermometer gas thermometer the name is exactly what you're dealing with. It says constant volume, and that's what it is. It's essentially a container that has a fixed volume. It does not expand, right? A fixed volume. Now, as the temperature is increased, or as heat is applied, that's way too thick. As heat is applied, the pressure in the container changes. Pressure builds up in the container. Basically, it's it's a glorified pressure cooker, for want of a better explanation. Now, this pressure increases, or rather decreases, based on the change in temperature, and the change in pressure is interpreted as a change in temperature. These are your three basic thermometers. And that's the end of part one. This series may have to have more than two parts, but we shall see. Thank you for joining, and as always, like, share, subscribe, and feel free to comment. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye.